Hello Namibia, my name is uh, Dr. Lachia Hamunyela. I'm a specialist in psychiatry and mental health and also an addiction professional. So we said like we, we look at COVID and mental health as two dimensional. So person who's having COVID then can actually experience anxiety symptoms, the common things, uh, the anxiety symptoms. Then we have depression, then we have substance, substance use or abuse and then we, that also can lead to suicide. So now in this period, what is important is to know that mental health itself can lead to physiological or physical symptoms that will then lead a person to present to a healthcare workers. So in the meantime, what, are, what is important to do in this current moment, we are saying that we need to get vaccinated to prevent ourselves and our loved ones to get COVID and mental health uh, consequences of having lost somebody, loved one, to COVID or even you yourself, and then having to have experienced any of the mental illnesses, depression and anxiety. We are saying it is treatable. We are saying if we vaccinate ourselves, we care about our near people, our entire country, and therefore we protect them by getting that vaccine which is available. Let us stop ourselves from getting false information from social media and get to be scientific. And it is very important that at this time we love ourselves and we love the ones that are around us and the nation and protect themselves from getting COVID or get, getting consequences of mental illness or to have to die, which we can prevent. So welcome back to the conversations with Flon. It's been a while, but we're back. And we are also going to do a focus where we're looking at things related to COVID. Many of you who've watched all of our previous programs will know that we were dealing with issues of vaccination, treatments around COVID, mental health around COVID. And today we'll be dealing with another pandemic, a pandemic that was with us before COVID and a pandemic that we know will be with us after COVID. And that's gender-based violence. And today we've got a panel of experts when we'll be looking at how has COVID impacted gender-based violence. The statistics today don't look great. And what we also know, when there was no COVID pandemic, we knew that the kind of things that aggravated gender-based violence was loss of income, economic anxiety, feelings of isolation and loneliness, feelings of uncertainty, an increase in substance abuse. And when you correlate that with what's happening with COVID and that COVID has exacerbated each one of those risk factors, we can only assume that COVID has gotten worse. But we wouldn't know that as the Office of the First Lady. The experts would know that. And as many of you know, our conversations with Flon are based on us listening to experts. It's also based on the assumption that love protects whether it's getting a vaccine to protect your loved ones, or also saying you don't beat up the people that you love because love protects. So I'm eager to really introduce you to my panel, and I'm going to start from my right with uh, Mr. James Itana from Regain Trust. Then we've got Mrs. Elizabeth Vial from the Gender-Based Violence Investigation Unit. She's a social worker there. And then I've got uh, Ndilo, who is an activist and a program officer for Positive Vibes. And then we've got uh, Chief Kanime, who is the head of the city police, who will be speaking about statistics from the city of police, but he'll also extrapolate some of that um, to give his views on from a national perspective. But I, I do want to remind you that um, you are from the... Ministry, Ministry of uh, Safety and Security. So the NAMPOL statistics <coughs> will be also <coughs> incorporated into what Elizabeth has to say to us. So I think with those in quick introductions, I'd like each panelist to introduce themselves. <coughs> um, and I'd really like to start with you, James, just things that are top of mind for you right now. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Madam Ginkos. Uh, so as, as you've introduced me, I'm James Itana. I'm uh, the executive director for Regain Trust. I 
regard myself as a, as a feminist, I'm an activist, uh, I stand for, for social justice. Um, I, I really think, I mean, sort of on the, on the get-go, what has stood out for us um, uh, as we gain trust in terms of, the, the gender based, in terms of gender based violence and what we've seen uh, as we were going through the pandemic is that it's really become a, a pandemic within a pandemic. Uh, and it's almost as if, you know, it's become a lot more hidden. Uh, we, we, we are seeing that, you know, um, access uh, for survivors and victims have been, has been very difficult to navigate, uh, quite, quite worrisomely. Uh, and and, and we, we've also quite, you know, picked up on, on issues around SGBV, uh, especially amongst adolescent girls and young women. And then I think um, our, our focus as Begin Trust has, you know, we've had an increasing focus uh, or an inc increased priority on one, wanting to work with adolescent girls and young women because we're realizing the increased vulnerabilities that they are, that they are sitting with. Uh, I mean, we've seen the statistics around learner pregnancy and mm -hmm. I often ask, you know, how many of those statistics actually speak to the issue of sexual violence? Absolutely. Uh, and we know that, you know, we may have the statistics of learner pregnancy, but we may not see um, some of these young girls coming and actually reporting instances of, of sexual violence and it could be because of the difficulties that they have in terms of navigating services but it could also be sort of you know family and uh, community pressure that is placed around them to not talk about this because it's going to bring shame um, to the family. So I mean at the top for the, those would be really our, our key issues that we would want to talk uh, about uh, during this discussion and thank you so much for having us here. Thanks James. <laughs> Elizabeth? Thank you for having us here, uh, Madam Gankos, and um, for giving us this opportunity. As, as you introduced me, I'm Elizabeth Val, social worker at the Gender-Based Violence Protection Unit. Just a short correction, oh, I'm from the Ministry of Gender Equality and Poverty Eradication, um, as line ministry to the Ministry of Safety and Security at the GBV Unit. I've been there for five years now bit long <laughs> 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 but uh, like I always say somebody has to do it yep. um, we've had a lot of issues a lot of challenges um, concerning the COVID pandemic we've seen a lack of access effective service delivery and there's been also the fact that it's almost like the system is failing to meet all and especially where sexual gender-based violence is concerned and gender-based violence. Because it is not just a person reporting. The aftercare, which has become really important to mm. us, how we can pull people together. Because it doesn't just matter me saying that this happened to me, and then what? So even if the person goes to jail, even if the person is punished, what about the damage done, the brokenness, and how does that translate back into our societies? Um, and have to be said that we also had a lot of suicides from children mm. and as young as 12 year olds during this pandemic which has become a real problem and as we said previously we've also noticed that that all of the cases reported there's no correlation there's no synergy between stake stakeholders that databases have to be put in place so that we can start building profiles, start knowing and start targeting the problem at its root. And as I, as I always said, uh, my ministry will not be impressed. We have become ambulance chasers because we are very few staff and we're working as best we can, but the problem is bigger. And that holding hands can only happen once we actually know what is the problem? How can we target it? Who can do what? And pull our resources together in order to tackle it. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. And I'll, I'll jump straight to Ndilo because I can feel her nodding in, <laughs> <laughs> in agreement next to me here. <laughs> Uh, yes, very much so. And uh, thank you once again for having us here, for having me here. And just to reintroduce myself, Dilo Kelwan Tengwe, and I'm an intersectional gender justice activist and also a new author now. So I think what is at the top of my list at the moment is really how we can also incorporate reproductive justice within addressing the scourge of SGBV in the country, because that is often a topic that is left unspoken yeah. and unaddressed. And then also looking at the sexual and gender and sex minorities as we know them as LGBTQ plus community 
and how they've also definitely been affected by the effects of the pandemic. Mm. And then coming back into just, I think, the experts that will be here in the room, I think I really want to just take in mm. as a sponge, also just to inform my activism work and really how we can radicalize the systems already, as, as it was mentioned, you know, just to, to ensure that we find other innovative, creative ways to ensure that we, we really create those measures and, you know, institutionalize those measures that would, in a way, mitigate what we are currently facing and sitting with. Yeah, I think in a nutshell. <laughs> well, thanks, Ilo, and congratulations on your, on your book. Thank you. <laughs> Chief Kanime. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Gaydros for inviting the city police to this uh, discussion. Um, our approach is more on uh, the statistics. As uh, you correctly put it, that it does not look good. Um, it's on the increase, mm -hmm. and moreover, during our investigation, it all came out that more cases went unreported because of the situation. One cannot mm. go out at night, and one can, sometimes you cannot sneak out. So only when it reached a boiling point that uh, the victim can no longer take it, then uh, mm. he, he or she will report it to the police. Um, again, um, in, in this case, we also see cases at areas where it was not normally reported. Mm -hmm. um, we divided the city in two zones, and we have a uh, zone like zone one, that is the informal settlement Havana and uh, Okuyongava. We have uh, zone three, um, that's the area of Koreanakab. We have uh, zone 10, that is the area of Ochomuise, and zone three, the area of the all locations. It's where we normally have those cases. But now, it go up to the influent suburbs. So because of this COVID, because of these people trapped, find themselves trapped into their houses. So it, it, it's now coming up in, uh, in all those areas. So it's, um, it, it's a really difficult situation. It's a situation that need to be attended to. Um, as it was said, is a pandemic within a pandemic and therefore we need to focus so that even after COVID, we will find ourselves in such a position th where we were able to handle the situation. And there's w there will be no any other good time to start rather than now as a system. I, I, I used to, to, to call it that, yes, it's a system that is working, that is working like uh, not being a system. And therefore, we really need to make our approach or to, to come up with a, a systematic and thorough approach toward this pandemic. And, and if I listen to all four of you, I think if I have to synthesize what you are saying, is that we need to break down silos mm. between those who are part of the national response to GBV so that there is the integration that uh, Chief is talking about. Yes. Um, and when I listen to what you're talking about, um, adolescent girls and young women, you're talking about uh, LGBT plus community, mm. that the response must always be inclusive. Mm. And then what all of you said was the issue around data. Mm. Um, Elizabeth, you were very clear on that and that that, in that data needs to be integrated and probably yeah. electronically available so that it's quickly available, that we can spot patterns, yeah. as you were talking about, because we can't address an issue that's coming like suicide in young people mm -hmm. if we each only seeing it from our silo. Exactly. Um, so it's interesting how a lot of what you were saying is coming together there, and which also yeah. makes us think there is a lot of funding going to the COVID-19 response and perhaps we should start thinking about GBV in the context of COVID yeah. mm. um, because it was there before COVID, it's, there, it's increasing during COVID and it will be as big a problem after COVID. So when we're thinking of COVID-19 response, we mustn't forget about existing pandemics. Um, we talk about um, hepatitis, uh, but we're not talking about GBV in the same context. So thank you very much.
And I'm going to do what I always do with the conversations with Flon. I do hand over to somebody else. Today I'll be handing over to Pefimbo, who will be asking you the questions that she has sourced. She'll introduce herself and what she does. But before Pefimbo starts, I just want to share some random information with you. Where this afternoon we had a trauma debriefing um, session with a trainer, uh, Dr. Boerter, and with many, many religious leaders, we had some survivors of COVID, we had life skills teachers, we had healthcare workers. And the reason we focused on them was um, often the person helping other people is never asked, how are you doing? Mm. It's like when you have a strong personality, everybody calls you for assistance, but nobody ever asks, James, how are you holding up? Mm. And, and I just want to let the four of you know, because I know that so many people stand on your shoulders, is that we are with you, we are behind you, and I hope that you're okay. Because if you're not okay, you can't help other people to be okay. So I just wanted to say that, that I am thinking about all of you who deal with trauma, who deal with grief, and who deal with people's distress that yours is not ignored, it's acknowledged, it's recognized, and the need for you to ask a trauma debrief yeah. is important, especially now when trauma is um, at an all-time high. Yeah. Um, so, so, Pethimbo, on that note, if you could take over. Thank <coughs> you so much, Madam Gengas. Um, good evening, Namibia. My name is Pethimbo Shipunda, and I'm a senior social worker in the office of the First Lady. Um, so. Part of my work, I do case management where I deal with individual um, clients, I do family and um, group settings. Um, and also on top of that, um, I do statutory work where by we I go to court, I testify in court, um, and then I also act as a, um, a vulnerable support person. Uh, whereby um, I stand by the uh, vulnerable witnesses. Okay, And then I also write reports to court. And then also in the office, we do capacity building and training where um, we train other professionals, when, especially when it comes to issues of gender-based violence. But also when time, um, times are changed, like during this time of COVID-19, we do divert. Um, for example, Madam Gengos just uh, mentioned that we had a training on trauma debriefing, which is something um, we never thought of. Maybe we're going to go there one day, but um, because of the need where we see a lot of people who are offering, um, giving support to others also need support or needs training so they can if, uh, effort, effortlessly do that. Okay? Um, so I'm going to jump into the questions. Um, that's in a nutshell what I do in the office. Um, and our first question goes to Chief Kanime. So Chief, um, some sources indicate a drop in sexual and gender-based violence cases during the lockdown, while others show an increase. What are the findings of city police in so far as sexual and gender-based violence is concerned, and does this data match what is happening on the ground? And additionally to that, are you noticing any patterns specifically to sexual and gender-based violence crimes committed during the lockdown, and would, you, um, would your observation be extended to the entire country? Thank you very much. Our finding as far as um, the gender-based violence cases are concerned is that uh, they are on the increase. And there is a new occurrence or phenomenon that is there now, which uh, in the past was not much, and that is the issue of unreported cases. Mm. You only come to know this once you start investigating and interrogating. On the same note, the unregistered case, cases, uh, they are also on the increase as opposed to the or before COVID. Um, we have two types. We have registered and unregistered. Registered is when it's registered to the police as a case. Unregistered, it's only when a person called the police, you attend or a social worker attend, but they don't want to go further with that. Or they just want assistance. We call it police assistance. So 
come to the point of uh, pattern, whether there is a pattern on it. Y yes, the old cases or the old <coughs> areas where these cases always take place, yes, remain the same. But a new pattern came in and it's where other areas that were normally, no cases were reported previously, they are also coming in. So, w what we are saying is that we have now new zones that are now affected. W one is asking yourself why. There are many reasons. One is that these people found themselves trapped in the same house with a victim, permanently, especially during a lockdown. And again, it's an issue of unemployment. It's an issue of drug and alcohol abuse. It's an issue of learners becoming more pregnant, unwanted pregnant. <coughs> Why? And, and or if you look into this, most of this, they are impregnated by people around them. It's the cousins, it's the nephew, it's the uncle, it's the neighbor. It, it's happened that way. So those are the situations that we are experiencing now at this point in time during COVID. Um, pandemic. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Chief. Uh, and then Chief has mentioned that um, there's a lot of teenage pregnancies as well. Um, and then uh, the second question goes to Ms. Ndilokelwa. Um, this has to do with children as well. So how has the pandemic affected the civil society's work in addressing sexual and gender-based violence and violence against children? All right, thank you so much for the question. I think just in response to that, I think civil society organizations like all the different institutions were not prepared mm -hmm. economically, infrastructurally, and, and prog programmatically. Mm -hmm. And so you find that the devastations were very, very serious, right? And I think with myself, when I was still with Outright Namibia, a human rights-based organization for the LGBTQ community, is that in that short period before in, in lockdown, the first time that we had that first lockdown, we also periodically had to close, and so hence our services also had to. We need to. We had to find some, some creative ways, you know, to now access and reach the communities that we were also that were also beneficiaries of our programs at the time. And so during this process, definitely there was an increase in also this suicidality and suicide attempts, especially for the minority communities that are often also shunned from different so, um, you know, public services and stigmatized and also the discrimination as we, as, we, as, we, as we know it. And so also to my knowledge, I think last year when they, I think there was a stimulus package that was tabled or stimulus, stimulus budget for the economy for a revival package, but I didn't see CSO also sort of listed under there. And hence, we did not see also some of the resources trickle into the different civil society organizations to capacitate themselves, especially during the lockdown period. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the status on, 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 on a frontline front line service pro provider also was not granted. And hence, there was also a lot of immobility within the civil society organization, so they could not necessarily travel to the communities and also provide different services. And at the time, we were just really looking at different simple packages like food parcels and maybe other social, psychosocial support, you know. So I think in context of that is that nobody was prepared, mm -hmm. but civil society also, from a resource angle perspective, they were very much also hard hit. Mm -hmm. And then I think when we come to, to children in the country, I think I don't really have much to add on to that. But often I find that women and children are grouped together and so the violence is meted out as a single unit to them. So I would definitely assume that the violence has definitely also skyrocketed in that specific avenue. Yeah. Mm. And that's what we're seeing as well. We saw some statistics from the Commons region and Dilo where even the pregnancies, and I don't want to call them pregnancies at all, mm. in primary schools are yeah. increasing. Mm. Those are rapes because yeah. generally those are our children under the age of 16. Mm. So I think the, the violence has increased across the board, particularly towards women and children. Mm. An interesting thing that came out, and maybe Chief Kanimo can talk about it later, 
is that we also saw an increase in men reporting gender-based violence, um, which is a good thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, and James um, will also talk us through that later. So you can continue, please, with your questions. Okay, thank you. So the following question is for Mr. James. Um, Mr. James, what happens when the home is not a safe space? Are women staying and suffering in silence, or are they seeking services, particularly shelters? Um, also, how um, has the way shelters respond to sexual and gender-based violence and vulnerable persons in society changed because of the pandemic? And how can we strengthen the shelter's ability to keep services or to keep survivors safe during the pandemic? Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, <coughs> you know, I'd, I'd start off by saying that um, the, the, the home has not been safe mm -hmm. um, even before the pandemic. COVID. Uh, the, the pandemic has just um, worsened uh, the, the, the vulnerabilities of the risk factors um, for, for women and children. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm trying to sort of um, think of this from, from, you know, beyond thinking just about the numbers, but to actually think about, you know, the, the survivors. I'm thinking about, you know, how uh, you would have a woman that's locked up in the same household where you would have the perpetrator. And it would make it exceptionally very difficult for this woman to be able to try and, and, and seek help, try and, and, and reach out to be able to you know, get that service. It, it, it's been difficult for, for survivors. And, and that's why oftentimes where uh, I remember initially um, when, when we went through the first lockdown and we eased out of it, we had conversations and, and, and a lot of the service providers were saying, but yeah, the statistics went down. And we had to try and help you know, service providers understand that yes, reported statistics mm -hmm. went down, but incidences of, 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 of gender-based violence had gone up. Um, and, and, you know, another element, you know, when, when we're thinking of, you know, the, the, the impact of COVID-19 on gender-based violence, uh, I'm, I'm also thinking around, you know, how you would have women trapped in these households and you would have, you know, and, 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 and I'm looking at, at Chief Kanime here, uh, you know, I, I normally watch this COPS 99 program, and I, and I picked up that, you know, a, a lot of the, 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 the people who are violating the COVID-19 regulations and, and, and breaching the, 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 the curfews were men. And I, I can only imagine how, you know, that conversation would play out in the household where, you know, the partner violates COVID, goes and increases their risk of contracting COVID, now comes into the household, and now a conversation has to take place around you shouldn't, you shouldn't go out of the house. You are increasing my risk. You are increasing the risk for children. And as a result of that, violence then takes place in the household. Yet, um, this particular woman is unable to seek help or seek services. So that has been a very difficult uh, situation out there. And, and I also, you know, as an as a, as a, as a organization that provides psychosocial services, I've, we've had to ask ourselves very honest questions around, you know, we, yes, we, we do... The, the campaigns on social media to try and increase uh, knowledge of our services. We occasionally would go to print media, we would occasionally go to Good Morning Namibia. But I've actually come to the realization that our services are not as known as we would like them to be. Um, I remember going into a community in, 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 in the Omsati region, trying to engage community members and ask them, have you heard of Regain Trust? And a lot of these community members had not heard of Regain Trust. Um, some of them, for instance, would have misconceptions and still call the, the gender-based violence protection unit the women, women and child protection units, mm -hmm. so, which really speaks to the issue around in as much as we are having survivors sitting and being locked up with their perpetrators, many of them still do not know um, about the services. Many do not know that there is a, a toll-free 106 GBV helpline dedicated that should I call, <coughs> the, I, can, I can get assistance. Or children do not know that should I call the 116 child helpline, I will get um, uh, assistance. So that, that has been a, 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 a worrying trend for us before and, and now during this, uh, the COVID pandemic that has been exacerbated. And, and I think, I mean, to, to talk about the, the shelters, we've had long, long conversations about the, the state of shelters in, in the country. And I've always said that if we could have just dedicated half the resources that we did towards the, the COVID pandemic right now, if we dedicate just about half the resources that we do towards how we fought the HIV pandemic, um, the situation would have looked different. Because right now, 
our shelters, unfortunately, they, they, we had one of our main shelters that we as Regan Trust were trying to support. Um, the situation is not, it, it's not going well. Shelt especially shelters that are being run by civil society organizations, they are not coping, they are not managing. And that's, and that's the reality that we are sitting out there. So in terms of shelters, we, we don't have enough shelters. And we've said this on countless, numerous occasions. We do not have enough shelters. And I think, I mean, we need to, like, I, I love what you said, Ndilo. We, we, we really need to become a lot more innovative. We need to start thinking outside the box. I mean, we need to start considering. We have churches. And, and, and I remember how back in the day when we were fighting the HIV response, we had churches that were at the front lines of spearheading you know, the HIV response with, with, with the support groups that they would have with all of these initiatives. How, how do we go back to that drawing board and enable um, you know, churches, um, communities? We have the men and women community policing networks, a wonderful initiative. How do we empower those communities to perhaps manage shelters if we are saying that we do not have the, 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 the personnel and we do not have the capacity? And that's, that's an important point, and I think that's the collaboration between um, state services and, and CSO services. I think we're going to jump straight to um, Elizabeth. Okay. Um, the question for Ms. Elizabeth is, we are seeing alarming teenage pregnancy statistics coming from the Ministry of Education. They have indicated to us um, that they are dealing with more than 4,000 adolescent pregnancies during the year 2020, which is 100% more than the year 2020, 2019. They, they expect similar, similarly high teenage pregnancy numbers for 2021. They are also telling us they are finding increasing uh, pr um, teenage pregnancies even in primary and special resource schools. What are you seeing at the gender-based violence unit. Um, are any of these um, cases coming to the gender-based violence unit as rape? Or what is happening that young people appear to have been exposed more than uh, teenage pregnancy while at home? Mm. More to teenage pregnancies while at home. Thank you, Pafimbo, for the question. Yes, we have also been made aware of the alarming pregnancies, but these cases are seriously underreported. More so, we are hearing from the Ministry of Health. Um, I've, ha I've had four, three teenagers between the ages of 14 and 16 that's come from ANC. Now it's Can like. Can you say what an ANC is to people who don't uh, use abbreviations? Antenatal care. <laughs> 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 Sorry. Antenatal care. Um, come for antenatal care, and then it's reported through, through there. But in terms of how COVID has affected our children, our teachers at school, when schools were closed, children had nowhere to go. Our teachers used to be their first, their mm -hmm. front line. Yeah. So the ones that they report to, and such mandatory reporting was brought in by the uh, Child Care and Protection Act to make that easier and protect teachers to let us know because they're the ones who see the kids on a daily basis. Things have changed, bodies have changed, even if the child's not free to talk. They, uh, that was at least one referral where we could pick up these cases. But with close be the schools being closed, children don't have anywhere to go. They're at homes. At most times, parents don't know how to engage with their kids because mostly I go to work, children go to school. So now we are stuck and the frustrations are already high. So we have high numbers of child abuse that has come out. Parents that, out of frustration, just beat um, and don't know any alternative to... The teenage pregnancies, we have a lot of cases that's been reported not necessarily as rape, because children under the age of, of 16 who are pregnant, in fact, under the age of 18, who are pregnant by law, are children who may be in need of protective services. We are not saying they are, but they may be. So all of those cases must be reported by mandatory reporting to the Ministry of Gender. And the idea here is to give support. We are saying that our parental styles are deteriorating, maybe by picking this up. Children under the age of 14, it is rape. Primary school, it is rape. There is no negotiation. 
what we have picked up, if I could just add on to what's saying, is that there is, has been a lot of familiar crimes where SGBV is concerned. And familiar crimes, we could say with a fair amount of certainty, 90% of the rapes reported in this period are familiar crimes. That is the cousins, the stepfathers, those in the household. Strangers, 10%. The taxi rapes, on the corner rapes. The teenagers, like I said, uh, parents not knowing their kids, and teenagers being teenagers, wanting to explore, needing something, and there's nothing in the communities. Nobody was prepared, including the service providers. But they could not go out, so we had teenagers, and we have a trend of males over the age of 21, and as old as 56, engaging with, with girls as soon as they reach the age of 16. Because somewhere they got the impression that 16 is the age of consent. So although they would engage on social media, and we have another number of these cases, they'll engage with them on social media and start the grooming process. By the time the child is 16, they start a sexual relationship. So we have a, a number of these kind of, that is not rape per se, but it's still immoral practice. And some of it could be rape. If yes. you look at the definition of rape and how he talks about uh, co uh, coercion. Yeah. And I think we should probably start applying that definition of coercion mm. um, in some of these relationships where there's a clear power dynamic or a power imbalance mm. um, between a 51-year-old man and a 16-year-old um, adolescent girl. Yeah. And but that, that's immoral practice, if we can call it that you know, challenging the courts and standing up for that. And even having to sing, and um, for lack of a better word, re-educate that young child that that is not love. But that yearning, that desire to be loved, to be acknowledged as a person, that partic why the child is reaching out to somebody outside mm. of her peers group. Correct. I think we can... Okay, thank you. So the next question will come to Ms. Ndilo. Um, what are young people's perspective and attitude on sexual and gender-based violence, especially concerning issues around sex concern, violence, and substance abuse? How do we enhance the knowledge of adolescents and young adults around those topics so that we can curtail, so we can curtail those alarming increases in violence, including sexual violence, within this group age? Awesome. Thank you. What I really love about the conversation is that it really gets my activism <laughs> juices <laughs> flowing. <laughs> uh, so I think I, I would just start by saying, with, with I would say really at last year's protests, and specifically to shut it all down, is that it, it definitely demonstrated that young people's attitudes and, and voices have significantly been radicalized and their attitudes towards STBV, for example. And I'm just looking at the amount of young people that have shown up to speak about their issues and really looking at survivors themselves, looking at victims themselves also within the space already. And so that is one aspect. The other is really that I think that from my perspective and the amount of research that I've also been doing is that there's a lot of work already being done and that looks at sharing information, sharing content, especially <coughs> when we're looking at online. I know what Regain Trust does. I know, for example, with the One Economy and the Be Free campaigns and all of this. But I think really what, what, what we are missing a little bit is really just the, the visibilization of the projects in those areas that James had mentioned that is unlikely to be heard and shared. And it's really that when you go to the different communities, those rural settlements, is that you go and you also live with the knowledge, right? And it's really finding a way to make sure that we package the knowledge so that it remains with the communities that, 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 that are sort of being informed at that moment. So it's, it's really looking at that other perspective. The other part is really also when we're looking at sexual consent, and as rightfully so, as, as, as the First Lady has mentioned around how 
adolescents are not in a in a position to negotiate safe sex because of the many many power dynamics that are already existing and i want to touch on particularly now on reproductive justice and rape and how it is very much linked and i'm just looking at specifically on the 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 the, the steps that that you have to obtain for i would say a legal abortion and one of those is that you need to have a magistrate a certificate from the magistrate in the case of rape or incest and when we're looking at the scourge of sgpv you you would have to prove or you'd have to show that you went and reported the cases but now as chief has mentioned many many cases go unreported and some people also withdraw cases i think we have a high statistics on that so it's really how do we link the law and the service provisions and the institutions to ensure that maybe in this area this is where it can be strengthened and this part can definitely maybe be more liberalized and opened up for everyone else and 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 perhaps this is now where we look at now the perspectives and the youth and, and the attitudes maybe also changing and 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 informed the other aspect is also the online response mechanisms right because also during covid-19 people are in lockdown most of the escape mechanisms is online and many people now tweet a lot with facebook we instagram but when you when you report a case or when you when you when you find yourself in this position where it's past curfew you cannot go outside you can't go to the police station what are the online mechanisms maybe that the police can try to start incorporating working together with civil society organizations i know that lifeline childline and i think also the office of the first lady is also has this response mechanism for the past hour you know just toll free numbers etc but you also find for example just earlier this this week or it was today i think there was a young girl that was threatened online right and all of us we rallied and we said we're going to report this account but that ended there so we've reported the account but we've not taken the sort of the report further in terms of reporting the person so that person can still continue to to you know pose a threat to other people but uh but we just have like online you know twitter you can always report and stuff like that so it's really looking at how young people are also using the 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 social media which can also aid and serve as an institution of power that we use to to yeah to share our voices and mm. and share our 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 complaints yeah okay thank you um our next question is going to go to chief kanime um, Chief, we saw a number of statistics indicating that the value or and quality of um, seized drugs have almost tripled since the pandemic started. We would like to know whether drugs and alcohol play a role in violence in general and gender-based violence specifically. Please also let us know what we should ex um, be expecting now that alcohol restrictions have been somewhat loosened. Thank you very much. Um, the issue of um, alcohol, drug and alcohol abuse during this time of COVID, it's also very much on, in, on the increase. <coughs> Take note that uh, during this time, people have no m many issues to do or many, there are no many places to go. And as a result, in order for them to keep themselves busy, and easy their frustrations because of uh, this pandemic is to indulge themselves into alcohol and that one after the, 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 the alcohol and drug use then uh, come uh, gender-based violence. Um, it, it, it's, uh, it's always difficult at this point in time of uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic for the people really to do other issues. So it's, it's really very much on the increase. Um, in order for us to, to respond to this, uh, we, we need to reorganize ourselves. Various role players divide the roles amongst ourselves. Um, if you look into the way we are approaching this situation, we are doing it more in isolation. Um, I, I can talk about the city police. We have the statistics. And we are discussing that statistics on uh, 
a weekly basis and on a monthly basis where we compare it to the previous year and out of that we came up with um, possible responses to that one. But we are doing it in isolation despite the fact that we are inviting other stakeholders to come. And if you look again, we have um, many people or many organizations, being the government or <coughs> the private sectors, doing some activities. <coughs> but all our activities are not streamlined. We need to streamline our operational and administrative processes. Focus, first we need to focus on the detection. And after that, come up with a response plan to prevent the occurrence of that one, as well as the edu education of the public. But at this point in time, we are doing it uh, more in isolation. So what I'm trying to say is that we really need to develop a realistic action plan based on the situation that we have on the ground, based on the statistics that we have and looking into the underlying causes of this. And one of those underlying causes is alcohol and drugs. Um, if you look into the behaviors of our community, for entertainment means go and drink. Or laser time, the only thing that we can do is go and drink. But there are many, many things that are more productive. There are many things that we can do and aid progress and assist others and curtail the gender-based violence. But what we really need to do is to come together, streamline our processes, identify the role players, assign tasks, and with the main focus on the underlying causes of this issue of gender-based violence. Only then we are really able to come up with solution. Not only now, but even after the pandemic. The next question is going to Ms. Vile. Um, there have been lengthy delays in resolving court cases, um, with some being postponed, most notably in rape and human trafficking and sexual assault cases. How has this impacted um, survivors of sexual and gender-based violence and their families and even our collective ability to heal as a society? I think, uh, so one word, it is devastating because finalizing, being able to testify, being a witness to the offense is part of the healing process. Mm. It's part of having my say is to say what you did was wrong. And when we don't give them that opportunity, we are adding not only stress, and we've seen a lot of psychological uh, uh, problems developing in victims of SGBV because it never finishes. And the family also have to carry this burden over and over. Moreover, um, the uh, rate of suicide goes up persons being unable to fully participate in society because b going to work, it becomes too stressful. Yeah, feeling that the person is everywhere and the person will harm you again. So in one word, and to keep it short, it is devastating and it is part of how we heal. Okay, thank you. Um, the following question is going to Mr. James. Um, the majority of perpetrators of sexual and gender-based violence are male. There are perceptions that activism against sexual and gender-based violence has historically been focused on women and children at the marginalization of male survivors. Has this changed during the pandemic? Has there been an uptick in male reporting? If so, is there a specific explanation to that? Sure, I'll, 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 I'll say this, that um, <coughs> quite interestingly, we've, we've noticed, um, uh, and this is from, from our side as Regain Trust, and, and um, what we did was during the, during the pandemic, we, we ran a talk show uh, called what, what We Men Talk About. And, and what we noticed was that during the time frame that the talk show was airing, the, the number of, of, of men who would come out and speak out about 
having experienced violence had increased. So basically what I'm trying to say is that there's definitely a correlation between efforts to work with men and engage men and, and their willingness to be able to open up and to talk about them having been um, survivors and, uh, and victims of, of gender-based violence. Um, and, and, and I think, you know, if, if, if you know, the, the, the number of activities we are talking about, many different organizations, Women's Action for Development, Lifeline, Childline, um, Regain Trust, uh, a number of male engagement activities are currently uh, being implemented. Um, yet there's, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done when it comes to sort of the, the trust that, that has been somewhat lost by men when it comes to service providers. Um, oftentimes when we engage with men in these conversations, the first thing that they would say is that if I, would, if I were to go and report a case of, of, of gender-based violence against my partner, I would be made a mockery of at the, at the service provider end. Um, and in some instances, organizations have also tried to work with service providers to try and sensitize them around that. I think the Office of the First Lady, um, the Regain Trust, all the different organizations have really tried to work to strengthen the capacity of service providers to, to steer clear from trying to reinforce um, uh, male stereotypes around you know, men not being able to be, to be vulnerable. Okay. Thank you. And just the one more question on top of that. Um, how do men and boys deal with pent-up range of frustration, in your opinion? Are there any positive techniques they can employ to address um, the issue? Yeah, normally my training, I, say, I, I normally say in my training that, that, that men are like, uh, we, we're like balloons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we've, we've been conditioned to, to suppress and, and to try and not acknowledge uh, a vulnerability. And when I'm talking about vulnerability, I'm talking about, you know, uh, uh, situations that would um, cause you to experience uh, pain, whether be that pain, even if that pain were to be, you know, emotional or psychological. And, and oftentimes, you know, uh, you know they, they would just try and suppress and suppress and suppress and, you know, and, and, and allow that sort of emotional pain to then turn into anger. And, and quite interestingly enough, anger is the only sort of outlet that, is, that we've been socialized or allowed to express as, as men in our society. So I think if, if we're to try and address this, we, we need to create spaces and opportunities for, 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 for it to be okay for men to be vulnerable. Um, and, and to try and reshape our thinking of, of, of masculinity uh, and, and reintroduce the concepts of you know, positive masculinity, that vulnerability is, is, is the new strength, that being vulnerable enables you to acknowledge the, the pain that you have experienced. It also enables you to be able to go out and reach services or to speak and, 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 to, and, to, and to access services. So, so I think... The, the best technique for now that I would say is, is for men to actually go out there and to seek help now that we know that you know, services are for everyone. Services are not just for, 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 for women and children, but services are open for everyone and, and no one should be denied the ability to, to go and seek services. Sorry, can I yeah. just quickly jump in there about seeking services for GBV? It's not just around GBV or anger issues yeah. or mental health issues. We saw it with HIV, yeah. where fewer men are testing, therefore yeah. fewer men are on treatment for mm -hmm. HIV. We're seeing it now with COVID-19 vaccines, yeah. where more women are vaccinating against COVID-19 than, than men are. And yeah. maybe the two of you could explain to us, where is the problem? <laughs> I, I, would, I mean, from my side, and I hope I can, yeah. I can also hear from Chief <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's... it's, it's the, the, the idea of, of manhood that, that basically you know, indicates that we, we, we cannot be seen as vulnerable. Um, so having been seen accessing a service, uh, be it going for an HIV test, and, and knowing that as a man I take uh, a lot of risks and I can already play in my image, oh, I've, 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 n I've had Maria's Joanna so, for so long and, and, I, and I know it was unprotected, so there's a possibility of me having HIV and I associate H having HIV with uh, vulnerability and being weak and being seen weak in my society. So men try and run away from that sort of vulnerability and, and they would much rather, you know, live in a world of sort of ignorance and not acknowledging it until the very end. And I'll be very honest, that I've lost quite a number of friends as a result of that, you know, we don't seek services, we don't go and get tested for HIV. 
Yet when the symptoms come and we are now at the stages of, you know, developing a, a full full blown AIDS, that's when we want, want to run to services. So there's this issue around men Helps and their perceptions of vulnerability. Yeah. 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 Chief Kanimi, what is that? Yeah. Um, <coughs> maybe let me start it by relate it to the statistics. Um, most cases, frequent incidents of uh, gender-based violence that are targeting men or where men, uh, men are victims are either economic abuse or emotional abuse. Um, an, an example of uh, economic abuse. We have men that month end, his salary is apportioned or let me start by saying his bank cards are taken away. That's one. Or his salary is apportioned. Some went to the, to the wife. Some went to the support of the children. Some went to buy other ex expenses. And he's left with nothing. But he's afraid of taking it up. Only of recent we also observed them, men coming out. But still, from unreported to unregistered. He only come and ask help, but he don't want to take it up. And you say, fine, I think this situation, looking at it, you really need to be counseled. You need counsel counseling. Yeah. He, 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 he won't take that one. Mm -hmm. And it's, as it was said by... Mr. James, that a man always don't want him to s be seen vulnerable. He's always trying to swallow everything until uh, the boiling point. Uh, or the anger will even force him to do other issues. And that is what we really need to tell our fellow men that come forth. There is a remedy to this. This thing can be rectified. That's what uh, they really men need to know. Yeah. So the emphasis here is really on help-seeking behavior, on whatever is troubling you, okay. to avoid escalations which harm others. Mm. Because if we're talking about men with this need to protect, love mm. protects. Mm. So you don't want to take COVID home, you don't want to take HIV mm. home, you don't want to utilize your fists because you're frustrated. Mm -hmm. um, so help-seeking behavior prevents an escalation. Yeah. Um, Pithimba, we can go. Okay. Um, the next question is to Chief. Um, I think Chief, you're on the <laughs> hot seat today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the pandemic has changed many things, um, and so much focus has shifted to the response of COVID-19. How can survivors be assured there is help for them during this time? Yeah. Um, it, it's it's a very good question. Um, we have the law enforcement who are first respond, responder to any incident. And we are organized in such a way that we look into the sensitivity. We know how to handle all the situation. And we are linked to other service providers. Um, we are in touch with um, Lifeline. We are in mm. touch with... Uh, the Minister of Gender Straight. We are in touch with the uh, Gender Investigation Unit of the Namibian Police. We are in touch with uh, those people that are running uh, the safe uh, uh, havens. So what we want the people to know, the victims to know, is that there is always people that are prepared to assist you and facilitate for you to overcome that problem. Therefore, just call us. Call the numbers like that of uh, the Namibian police, one zero triple one, or the city police, um, then three zero two three zero two. We have uh, teams that are organized to take you further so that you can get that um, service required for you, irrespective of uh, your gender being a man. And these people are trained to keep that information and not to reveal it to unauthorized people. So only then we can really able to overcome those problems. Thank you, Chief. Um, the following question is going to go to Ndilo. Um, 
We know you have a strong opinion on, on how gender-based violence response can be improved. And I think you have mentioned already something earlier about social media. Um, but maybe you can just add, if you have any other, um, what would you advise um, what would you advise um, to those who are in charge of the national response to gender-based violence? All right, awesome, thank you. I think I'd like to add that not only is the opinion strong, it's also, I'd like to think, very important, informed and evidence-driven. And that's really because we have a lot of people that also have strong opinions, but it's really laced in a lot of ignorance and hence they continue to perpetuate the same behaviors and especially as we've seen with with COVID-19 as well. So I just wanted to just add that little <laughs> fact there. And the other is really that with institutions, the, with the national response is really looking at it from a COVID-19 response plan that is inclusive and, and practical. And especially that already is embedded in the pre-existing plans that so many organizations already have. So that's one aspect and really to capacitate the NGOs with resources because at the moment, really, without resources, really, there's not much mobility that you, can, that you can have around. And also, I think just coming back from the Love Protects campaign is Love Protects and resources uplift and they also provide security. Yeah. So that's also one angle that we can look at how resources can assist with um, civil society organizations. And... Yes, I think that's what I would like to add for, 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 for government is also with the public institutions is that they continue to be custodians and not gatekeepers, right? And lastly, also just that not a single organization or institution can hold the process for the response. So this is really that we can work all collaboratively, intersectionally across to achieve this one goal that we, that we want to see. Okay. Thank you. Um, the next question is going to Ms. Vial. Um, our office is dealing with um, cases of single mothers who are forced to lock their toddlers and young children at home as they have to go to work. Um, and at the time, there was no school. We have also seen children burning in shacks as parents went to drink and left them unsupervised. What needs to be done around improving access to child care, especially for single mothers? Um, Related to that, how do we ensure that parents do not leave their young children unsupervised as we know it leaves children more vulnerable to sexual violence or even dying in, um, in shacks uh, fire? Uh, yes, it's a good question because we have been fielding children that's been abandoned or left uh, with inappropriate supervision like a... Th um, a one-year-old left with a four-year-old um, in a shack in the middle of the night and mom is nowhere to be found. So we have been dealing with these cases before COVID, during COVID, and I think long after. In the Child Care and Protection Act, it's been outlawed. It's been made a criminal offense. That is not out there. The ministry... Obviously, the government, we don't want to separate children. So our first response is always to uh, rectify, to reify. You've done this wrong. How can we help you be a more positive, better parent? Like we said, love do protects. But at times, because the city of Vinduk also made available um, child care centers cheaply, most people use the facility to basically abandon the children there. And once again, it's this reaching out, asking for help. And when I ask for help, I'm going to get into trouble. So I think the most important lesson we want to say here, we have also made it not a criminal offense if you go and put the child in a place of safety like a hospital. You will not be charged. Um, Rather go and give the child there with all of the documentation and we will take it further. But if you need help, there are resources available with the Ministry of Gender because we have programs that we can help to assist to be a better parent. Okay. So there's a number of numbers coming out here. Um, one zero triple one, um, when you need emergency services, um, 
106, one if you would like somebody to talk to or you'd like to have counseling and it doesn't have to just be for GBV, it could also be for anxiety, just feeling powerless, um, whatever you're feeling, there are people you can speak to. And um, Elizabeth is saying that please contact the Ministry of Gender as well because they also have resources available to help people who are feeling very vulnerable at the moment. I think I don't want to summarize what the panelists have been saying. I'd like you to have three minutes each to really summarize what you believe Namibians must know about COVID-19 and its relationship with gender-based violence. Uh, I, th I think for me, um, what, what, what would be important is, is, is uh, for us to, to, to realize and recognize that what, what the pandemic has, has done now is that it, it has increased the, 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 the burden on, on women already. Uh, because normally we, we, we say in our societies, women carry the burden of care. Uh, we talk about you know, the hidden economy. So that, that burden has been, you know, it's, it's been added. It's, 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 there's, there's, there's an increased weight. Uh, and, and, and I see it playing out in households, you know, where, for instance, if the mother is working from home and the father is working from home, it's the mother's responsibility that that burden is placed on the mother to be able to manage her work and also then take care of the children um, and, and and i really think that you know as a, as a nation we really need to try and and shift the thinking uh, around how do we start talking more and more about you know fatherhood how do we promote the notion of of a present father i mean even in this conversation that you just had now uh, the, the the focus was on single single mothers and my question will always be, but where are the, where are the fathers? Mm -hmm. So I think that there's a need for us to really reshape and, and start talking more about, you know, how do we promote positive masculinity? How do we talk about men being there, men being caregivers, uh, and, and, and break away the stereotype around men only fulfilling the three roles of, you know, provide, protect, mm -hmm. discipline. They need to yeah. admit to fatherhood first yeah. before exactly. they can be caregivers. <laughs> True. But <laughs> ignore me. <laughs> Yeah, so that would be it for me. Thanks, James. <laughs> um, if I can say from to, to the nation out there, yes, by first lockdown, I think people were under the impression we were not there. We were sitting and waiting for you. We are still sitting and waiting. Mm -hmm. And what I think needs to really come out here, we talk a lot about laws and about punishment, but it's not about that. It is also about services that is made free of charge available by government, for any person out there who needs help. And we will first start to see how can we rectify, how can we help to mend what is being broken before punishment, every time. That's why we we'll first start with social workers before we start with the criminal stuff. Mm. So for everybody out there, including single mothers or fathers who just says mothers are driving them crazy when they want to be fathers, reach out because we can always build that bridge and mend. There's always a way. I realized I better withdraw my words because my husband used to be a single father at some point. So I really, re I withdraw all those rude <laughs> comments I was making. <laughs> 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 okay, no. Definitely. Thank you once again. I think my response would just looking at using inclusive data for adequate response mechanisms. And I think this just comes at the backdrop of just this, uh, an interview I did just a few weeks ago. And they really showed about the, e the decrease in the, in the rape cases. But it decreased from, and this was just like the recent statistics, they decreased from 1068 to 1018. And what I calculated was that was just a 4% decrease. And at the same time, I looked at the statistics of the COVID-19 vaccinations, and at the time it, wa it was about 43,000. So I tried to do like a mental calculation. So what is the ratio between 1,018 versus 43,000? That was a 1 to 45 ratio. So to my mind, I thought, okay, maybe it looks like we have more for every one, for every rape case, there are 43 per 45 people vaccinated. So I thought, are we protecting more? Are we are we protecting people that get vaccinated more or our, is it adolescent girls and the victims, etc.? So it's really looking at 
I'm killing two birds with one stone. So you look at, okay, the more you vaccine, maybe you can also spread out the area, spread out the information there. When people come to the COVID uh, centers, they also have another access to a different health service, maybe SGBV related, so that that can also maybe be feed and, and channeled into the police systems or the GBV unit streams, so that that way, you know, you can kill two birds with one stone. So it's really using the data much more innovatively. Yeah. Good job. Yeah. Mm. Chief? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are at the most difficult situation. And therefore, it's, um, it's, it's a right time for us to reorganize ourselves. Look into all those role players in this gender-based violence. Then we streamline our operational and administrative approaches. Then we, sh we, we, we give ourselves roles so that each hand should know what the other hands is doing. We have the statistic at the city police and we need to use that statistics. And we need to start with that situation now. We need to start educating the public. Not only to wait until such thing happen, but let's detect, let's train and educate the people how to detect the symptoms of possible gender violence victims then we report it but we need to reorganize ourselves and this is a higher time that we really need to do it otherwise it will just be business as usual even after the pandemic yeah. and it can't be business as usual if something that COVID has taught us in the ministry of health and social services has really led the way here in how they've opened their doors because of the pandemic to CSO organizations, to members of the private sector. And many of us are working closely with the Ministry of Health. We are integrated in there and it's bearing fruit. So if COVID-19 can open that door of collaboration of Namibians holding hands, working together, we can do it for GBV if we want to. And I agree with Ndilo. It's not possible that we want these high levels of violence, that we want these high levels of trauma because of the abuse of women, children, um, and men who are also being abused. So we're living in a time where we are prolonging everything. We are prolonging our grief. We can't even mourn properly right now. We're prolonging our personal needs because we're not sure what's going to happen in the future. We're prolonging our vacations. We're prolonging our birthday parties because we live in so much uncertainty. But one thing we can be certain about is we cannot prolong our response to gender-based violence. We must act now with the same energy that we are reacting to COVID-19 because we all know love protects. And when you love people around you, you do whatever you have to do to protect them. If that means going for anger management classes, if that means going to get vaccinated, if that means going to seek help for whatever challenge you have that's causing you economic anxiety, that's causing you to turn to substances, that's causing you to be frustrated and irritated. Even I, I love my kids, but they're becoming irritating, especially during <laughs> lockdown. So we can't prolong these feelings anymore. We must act, and we must all act now. So thank you very much for, for tuning in. We're going to lead straight into a video um, from a tra trauma counselor called Ben Schoenig. And Ben is going to share some very practical ideas about how to react when there's violence within a home or within a safe space where people are being violated. So we like practical advice, and I think these panelists helped us to give practical advice. So we're going to cross over to Ben's video at the moment, and I hope you enjoy what he has to say. Thank you very much for tuning in, and thank you to all the panelists for your very insightful comments. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you. you. Thank you. My name is Ben Schernick. I'm a social worker and a mediator by profession. And one of the things I'm concerned about is the underreporting of cases of gender-based and uh, domestic violence since the beginning of the pandemic. With the pandemic and the lockdown measures, uh, financial stress, emotional stress and, and other pressures have really led to people being emotionally more fragile 
and especially at a household level and within families, tensions can build up which can easily uh, lead to abuse and, and forms of violence. So in my experiences, there are basically two kind of cases. The ones where people handle those situations or get to manage situations of abuse and violence when it occurs, meaning the perpetrator or maybe both parties realize what in their behavior is actually harmful. Um, so that means they, they, they manage to reflect on what aspects of, of themselves um, is, is, is not helpful. It's, it's actually violent and harming their partners and themselves or what leads to an escalation of a conflict situation. So for instance, if a man um, is sad or is, is in pain or frustrated because of something and in that moment the, the wife or, or, or partner um, is asking him for something, putting a certain pressure on him, it's easy for his pain, frustration um, to really turn into anger and for that anger to also become violent and aggressive towards her. So in that case, he would need to realize that there is this frustration or pain pressure in him, but to really ask for, for, for a break or to use his anger um, in, in other ways, to, to, to seek that space, to sort it out, and then to continue the conversation with her. Uh, while for her, she would need to realize that it's important to give him uh, that space to not pressure him in that situation and for both of them to communicate in ways that is not violent, is not harmful to them or their children. That is one scenario and either couples can manage that realization and changing their, their way of communicating and behaving by themselves. Most of the times they do need the assistance of friends, family and most of all professionals. Uh, social workers, psychologists, to assist people in realizing what parts of my behavior is harmful to others and eventually to myself and to make a change. So that is the first type of cases that I've experienced and work with where change for the better is possible. And then there's a second type of cases where people have tried A, B, C and it's not working. Where it is important to realize that the level of abuse and violence that, that people are experiencing is becoming severely dangerous and it's, it's important to step out, to escape, to, to call it quits, uh, to separate, to divorce. And realizing that us as a couple we don't work out anymore but we still need to find ways of co-parenting and allowing our kids to have a relationship with each one of us as a parent. And in these cases it's really important for friends, family and professionals to help a couple or to help an individual in such a relationship to notice the warning signs and to make them realize what are the costs of staying in that relationship and to really help them create exit strategies, to help them create ways of stepping out and that may involve the police, that may involve definitely social workers, psychologists, safe houses and um, these, these types of um, scenarios are, are really important to notice and to act upon them and to really make steps out of them. And another example, for instance, is that men who are in abusive relationships and seek help uh, sometimes happen to come across friends who, who laugh at them and who say, no, how can your wife do that to you? Or even professionals who turn them down, who don't take them serious. And that is again something where it's about listening. It's about empathic listening and about understanding that no matter if you are a man or a woman, you can be the victim of an abusive relationship and you, you, you genuinely need help and assistance and people who care for you and who help you change the situation or get out of a situation that has become too violent or too abusive for you. In both of these scenarios, uh, being silent and doing nothing is actually quite dangerous because things escalate and they escalate beyond our control. So if you're in such a situation, ask for help. Call 106, 116, the free hotlines, go to Ministry of Gender, Ministry of Health, social workers, and, and get support, get advice. Um, talk to friends, family, and so forth. And if you are a neighbor or a family member or a friend, um, again, don't stay silent, engage with the individuals, and most importantly, listen. Listen, understand, 
and then help them to, to seek further professional help and assistance. And you can also offer to mediate between the couples, although that's something that we haven't developed much capacity for in Namibia yet. Um, and there's also one thing one should be aware of when mediating. Mediation is not to give people advice and tell them what to do. So I know personally of some cases where uh, senior family members, aunties and uncles were approached for family mediation, yet what they did is they they heard how violently escalated the situation is and then they advised the wife to just, you know, be a good wife and husbands do that sometimes and for the family to stay together because, you know, how it would look like if there would be a divorce. That is not mediation. That is not serving the interests of the parties. That is not healthy. So mediation is not about telling people what to do. Mediation is about helping people understand what would be best for them and to help people make the right and healthy choices. Yes, it may be frustrating if a relationship doesn't work out, but it's much better to have two healthy individuals separated, taking care of their children, rather than one dysfunctional, violent relationship where the kids eventually end up not only suffering, but repeating those violent behaviors in the future. So please don't stay silent, dare to care, listen to people um, that, that may be in distress, ask them and ask for help. There are a couple of options available, as I said, with the ministries of health, gender, social workers, police, psychologists, and also the free helplines 106 and 116. Thank you.